the, um, the Cabinet uh, meeting on 21st of March 2022. This is the um, officially the last Cabinet meeting in the, um, in the um, 2018 to 2022 administration. So hope you enjoy the last one um, as much as we've enjoyed all of the others. Um, just a couple of bits of, um, of housekeeping. I'm going to take um, items 9 and 10 um, at the beginning. Um, and then items 14 onwards um, will be taken in private. Um, first of all, so item one um, is apologies. Um, I'm not aware of any apologies. Um, however, there's several um, members and, um, and directors and officers who are joining um, online. Um, we can see who they are. I won't go through them all, um, but they're all here. Um, so. That can be agreed. Then item two is declarations of interest. Does anybody have any um, declaration, sorry, any interests to, to declare? That's a no. Um, then on to item three, minutes of the meeting held on the 7th of February. Can they be agreed? Okay, no disagreement there, agreed. So we'll move on, as I said, we'll take um, item. Oh, apologies. Um, 7th or, and the 21st of, um, of February and also the exam meetings on the 21st of February. They're all agreed, yeah? Fantastic. My apologies. In my rush to get to the um, uh, item nine of the Home to School Travel Consultation, I missed out a couple of those. So uh, my apologies. Item nine is the Home to, um, home to School Travel Consultation and the lead member on this is Councillor Stringer. Thank you very much, Chair. So colleagues may remember that back in November, we came to Cabinet with permission, for permission to begin a consultation looking at our policies on home to school or home to college travel assistance mostly looking at whether our policies were appropriate for the growing number of children and young people, especially education and needs and disabilities. So firstly, I'd like to thank Tom Proctor and colleagues for their really hard work on this. And a particular thank you to all of those who took part in the consultation. We had really excellent engagement with the consultation, both in terms of formal responses and from attendees at webinars and from input from meetings with staff and students at our special schools. I personally attended the webinars that Kids First held. Kids First are Merton's Forum for Parents of Children and Young People with Disabilities or Special Needs. It was brilliant to hear about the positive experiences, but also to hear about the frustrations and challenges of families who were directly affected by our transport policies and services. So we wanted to run a consultation because we hadn't reviewed our policies for a number of years and the context was changing substantially, with growing numbers of children being eligible for support and more and more travelling out of borough for their education. We wanted to have a constructive conversation with families about whether our current policies were appropriate and, and that particularly how it covers children in the early years and learners over the age of 16. What came through really clearly from the consultation was that what parents would most want is for their children to be educated close to home so that the transport options available to them could be as broad as possible. We're completely committed to delivering this and have already expanded our in borough places either in special schools or in additionally resource provision in mainstream schools. We've expanded substantially and we'll be delivering many more places in the coming years. We were never consulting on one particular policy change. We wanted a range of views on a range of options and we've listened carefully to those responses. And as you'll see from the recommendations, we have a clear commitment to supporting the independence and well-being of our young people. And we're not proposing, to, for example, to start charging for travel assistance like some boroughs do. We particularly heard from families and young people that independent travel training, that is teaching young people how to navigate from place to place using walking and public transport on their own. This travel training can be extraordinarily effective, but it needs investment. So we're proposing an additional £50,000 per year to fund more travel training for our vulnerable children. We also heard that while families thought that personal travel budgets, so providing funding directly to families who can, so they can find their own transport solutions, they thought this was a good idea, but they were not well advertised and they were seen as complicated and hard to use. So we're committing to increasing the promotion and the ease of use of this as an option. The other recommendations I hope are clear, that we will support over 16 year olds to use independent travel wherever possible, because that's what we want for them when they're adults. But we'll obviously continue to all provide organized transport where this is impractical. We'll ensure the best value for money, working hard to commission transport as effectively as possible. So Chair, I ask for your support on these recommendations, including recommendation I, 
that the amendments to the policy documents be delegated to the director for children's schools and families director for community and housing and myself to look at the detail thank you happy to take questions Thank you, Councillor Stringer, and I should emphasise our gratitude to um, to officers and parents for their involvement um, in um, in this um, this report. Um, the lead officer on this is uh, Jane McSherry, who's the director of Children's Schools and Families. Jane, did you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, nothing to add, Chair. Very good. Well, um, I was obviously pleased to hear that um, you know educating children closer to home is um, very much our priority. Um, and to hear the commitment to um, promoting personal travel plans for, for young people. I think that's really, really key. Um, and still that we would be, um, we're, we're keen for, um, for uh, to, we're prepared to organise travel um, for children when, when it's needed. Um, I don't think there are any further questions. So can we agree recommendations A to I? Okay, they're agreed. Thank you very much. So we move on to item 10, um, which is the extension of the school cleaning contract. And again, the lead member on this is Councillor Stringer. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is, this is, a, is a much more straightforward contract extension. So, so we want to um, procure for, uh, for a new cleaning, school cleaning contract, but we want to do this in line with the school year. So the previous contract that we'd awarded, Julius Rutherford, it was only um, for an initial period of three years. Um, so that and then that was extended to the end of this March, this month. So we're seeking approval to, for this to run till the 31st of July, 2022, so that will cover the full school year. And then during that time, we can undertake the procurement of new school cleaning contracts. And obviously we'll be coming back to, to cabinet with those decisions when needed. And I'd like to thank it's Tom Proctor again and Jamie Shelley for their, for their work on this and Murray Davis. Thank you for that. Very important to get the thanks in um, for, to, for everybody for the lot of hard work that's gone into this. Um, again, the lead officer on this is Jane McSherry. Jane, did you have anything you'd like to add? Nothing to add, Chair. Okay, um, I can see no questions on this. It's relatively straightforward. Um, so can we agree recommendation A? That's agreed. Thank you very much. Um, so we now move back to the um, um, earlier items. I should have said at the um, at the outset, um, Councillor Akujina, who's the um, the lead member um, on a couple of the items here, um, has um, has sadly lost her voice. Um, so I'll try uh, my best to um, to introduce um, her reports. Um, but I'd like to, before I do that, um, pay um, my credit to her and, um, and her team for the work that's gone into them. So the first of those items is item four, which is the Merton hate um, crime um, strategy. Um, and a, um, a great deal of work has, has gone into this, um, as the report um, outlines. Um, and there's been a lot of um, very useful discussion between the, the council and the hate crime strategy group. Um, and as a result of which, it's been agreed to go forward um, uh, with the uh, with the plan, and to update the strategy um, to cover the 2022 to 2026 um, period. Also, we should say that um, that the report has been updated um, to reflect um, the really extensive um, public engagement that we went through between um, uh, last summer um, as part of the Your Merton um, process. Um, and um, I'd like to thank um, the many thousands of residents who engaged with that. One of the key things that, um, that came out of that um, report um, was around um, the need to improve safety for all our communities. Um, and that has very much been incorporated here um, and will be a key part of our work in the, uh, the Merton 2030 um, set of priorities, which we just agreed for the council. Anyway, the, uh, the strategy is, um, is largely outlined in paragraph 2.15, um, of the report. Um, it's based around four strategic aims, preventing hate crime, protecting the victim and reducing the repeat victimiz victimization, providing suited support to people who have experienced or are su supporting victims of hate crime, and developing and implementing an integrated, robust and coordinated approach to tackling suspected perpetrators. I would like to speak personally and say that, um, that I feel that, um, that those objectives 
um, have, um, have come through very clearly um, in the report. Um, and I'd like to um, uh, move that, um, that we go to agree recommendations A and B. The lead officer um, on this is Chris Lee, who's the Director of Environment and Regeneration. Chris wants to draw our attention to anything in particular, have anything to add? Uh, nothing to add, Chair, but I know I or uh, Peter Clifton, who's the uh, report author, happy to answer any questions. Yeah, Peter Clifton, who's the Interim Head of uh, Community Safety. May I thank you and, um, and your staff um, for their efforts around this. Um, it's obviously um, a very important um, matter to um, to many of us in this room um, that we uh, that we reduce hate crime and that we have a strategy for dealing with it. I don't see any um, questions on this. Um, Councillor Fraser, do you want to come in? Thank you, thank you Chair. Um, I'd just like to say that I've been a councillor in this council since 2010, and I've been very impressed with the way we work as a council. Um, hate crime, we, we, um, regardless of whoever it's against, it's a sad thing, but against women and girls, it has been much more in the forefront. And so I'd like to thank all the um, officers and the cabinet member who've worked so diligently to make this thing work. It hasn't stopped. The work is just beginning and we are going to continue to do this until it makes an impact throughout. And so I'm really, really grateful to everyone for the work they've been doing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fraser, and that sort of moves slightly into the next item as well, which is very, um, very useful, but um, I do appreciate um, the comments there, and I hope that's been picked up by um, officers and staff um, and everybody watching of how um, important this is to us. There being no other questions, can we um, agree recommendations A and B for the, uh, the hate crime strategy? Agreed. That's agreed. Thank you very much. Um, and then that brings us neatly on to um, item five, um, which is on the uh, um, strategy towards the safety of women and girls in Merton. Um, and um, again, with Councillor Akagina's indulgence, I'll speak on, I'll try my best to speak on your behalf. Um, I'm sorry if I don't do it um, as well as you would have done. Um, but this, um, this report um, follows on from obviously the very serious um, events um, of, of last year, and in particular, the, uh, the murder um, of, um, of Sarah Everard um, by a serving police officer. Um, and the, um, the upshot of that was that we had a special council meeting here um, in, um, in Merton last April, um, at which a motion um, was agreed um, where we would um, undertake um, work to look into improving the safety of, um, of women and girls. And this report arises out of that. Um, one of the things that we did as a result of that was establish a task group, um, which first met in June 2021. And that task group um, focused on um, really four areas um, again. So the first was capturing the activities of the council and its partners that supported the safety of women and girls. Second was considering the wider policy and good practice on responding to the safety of women and girls. Third, identifying how we can engage with and capture the experience of women and girls in Merton. And fourth, um, identifying further interventions and approach that, um, that could enhance um, our, um, our response and any resource implications um, rising from, um, from that. There's quite a lot of um, significant work that the, uh, the council has done over the, um, the years. Um, one of the most uh, well known about is the Ask for Angela campaign, which was developed here in Merton, um, which is a, um, just a system for women to, um, to, um, to notify um, staff um, if they're in a pub or a nightclub and they feel that they're um, getting um, unwanted attention or inappropriate attention, they can ask for Angela um, behind the bar um, and then some support will be put in place for them. Um, a number of other um programs um, the wave program um and uh, also proposals to um to to improve and enhance things like uh, cctv um, which we've been working on over the last year big um some that's being set aside for that um 
and um, and obviously we have a um, a task group on the safety of women and girls, which will be meeting from uh, the autumn as well. But I'd like to thank um, Peter and um, and everybody who's been involved in the um, the drafting of this um, this report. The lead officer once again is um, is Chris Lee. Chris, did you have anything you'd like to add? Only to say, Chair, that this is a, a work in progress and there's more work to be done and more work being done. Uh, but happy to answer questions, I'm sure, Peter, uh, likewise. Thank you. And again, um, I'm not aware of any um, questions coming in, but so it might seem um, slightly um, peculiar that, um, that I, as leader of the council and the director um, and um, the interim um, head of um, community safety, are all men um, talking about um, an issue involving the safety of women and girls in, in Merton. But I think as um, Chris in particular, um, if you've ever seen his, um, his interview, has, um, has made it very, very clear. Um, the safety of women and girls is not just a women's issue. It's not just um, about, um, about girls. It's very much a, um, an issue for all of us. Um, and I'm very glad that the council takes it um, seriously. So can we agree recommendations A and B? Thank you very much. They're agreed. Which moves us on to item six, which is on the, the CPOs for estate regeneration. Um, and the lead member on this is Councillor Martin Wilton, uh, with Councillor Irons and, um, and Fraser also um, available. Um, Councillor Wilton, do you want to lead on this? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I formally move the report and uh, recommendations. As Cabinet colleagues will see, this is an incredibly um, extensive report, um, but it builds upon the Cabinet decision made in January 2018 and February 18, and to respectively agree in principle to use compulsory purchase power powers to support implementation of the Merton Estates Regeneration Programme. It was noted at that time that further requests would be made to make and serve further CPOs only once the following conditions have been reached. Um, the estate's local plan has been adopted, which has happened. Um, a resolution to grant planning permission has been made for the relevant planning permissions. An outline planning permission has been granted for all um, the development and uh, the first stages of High Path and, Rave and all of Ravensbury has now been granted with further stages to follow uh, later this year. An approach has been made to all landowners with a view to acquiring the land voluntarily and voluntary acquisition has not been successful. Um, also a statement of reasons setting out the justification of any CPOs has been prepared and a CPO indemnity agreement has been duly executed between the council and Clarion Housing Group, obviously in terms of the indemnification um, only the council has the power to issue uh, CPO powers, but clearly we will be recompensed in full um, by Clarion if we do um, exercise, if those powers um, are exercised. Um, this has been obviously a regeneration which uh, started back in the summer of um, 2013, um, where the council took the supporting principle to support regeneration, um, which was obviously then subject uh, to uh, the 10 commitments in terms of that regeneration scheme on those three estates. The consideration and justification for a CPO, 800 new, 808 new homes, which will comprise 289 affordable homes, High Pass Phase 2, Eastfields Phase 1 and Ravensbury 3 and 4. Uh, the proposed development reinforces the attractiveness of the estate as a vibrant and balanced community but also as well increased supply of high quality housing, creating an attractive living environment in the area and providing better quality, affordable homes. Um, at the end of February 2022, Clarion had already provide, acquired 229 freeholds and long leases across the Merton Estates regeneration area through voluntary sales under their 2015 residence offers. These consist of 130 freehold and leasehold interests at High Path, 88 at Eastfields and 11 at Ravensbury. Uh, many of these homes have subsequently been reused in terms of um, temporary um, housing, allowing people to be housed um, in the borough and increasing um, the supply. But there is obviously still homes outstanding that do need to be purchased. Uh, within Eastfields phase one, there is 33 freeholds and 14 long leases, which will need to be 
acquired within high path phase two and three, 18 freeholds and 29 long leases, and the remaining stages of Ravensbury, uh, three freeholds and one long leases. Although a large number of the acquisitions have been completed or in the process of being completed, it is clear that despite the significant efforts to get the acquisition by agreement of all the land, which is required to facilitate regeneration, uh, these additional homes um, will be needed if the regeneration um, is to be delivered um, as quickly um, as possible. Um, if the council was not to use um, its CPO powers, um, the regeneration would take um, a lot longer um, in terms of delivery and actually there would be barriers in terms of its um, viability. These powers are um, actually crucial in terms of being exercised, um, but we obviously do hope that um, people voluntarily sell their homes um, without um, having a CPO um, to um, be issued. Um, if we don't have to exercise um, CPOs, um, it will expedite um, developments um, on these estates, but these are a power to ensure that um, the regeneration um, is facilitated. Um, we believe it is the best solution um, for these three estates of Ravensbury, um, High Path and Eastfields, and I ask that um, Cabinet um, approve this report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Councillor Wilson. And um, once again, the uh, the lead officer on this is uh, is Chris Lee, Director of Environment and Regeneration. Chris, would you like to add anything? Uh, to add, Chair, uh, I know that uh, James McGinley and Tara Butler, who've been uh, deeply involved in this matter, along with Louise, uh, are all happy to answer any questions that we might have. Thank you, and um, and yes, um, very um, very important to to thank Tara, James, and um, and everybody who's been involved on this um, this very big and um, an important um, regeneration um, project. Um, there are no questions. Um, obviously, um, you know we hope that these powers are not needed. Um, we feel there's a good offer in place um, for um, for those who are involved, and it will obviously be a faster process. Um, and um, and fairer to the whole community um, as well, and overall um, with huge advantages for the whole community if we can go ahead without needing to um, to do CPO. Um, and the report itself is only really necessary um, as a move to ensure um, that, um, that people do have decent homes on these estates, um, or do move into new homes um, that, um, that they deserve to live in, good quality new homes, and also that many new families will be able to um, enjoy good quality um, housing and affordable housing um, in the future. Can we agree the recommendations A to F? They're agreed, thank you very much. So we'll move on to item seven, um, which is um, on the, um, the, the, um, the scrutiny task groups um, report into repurposing the high street. Um, and, um, and leading on that, um, at his last official meeting of the council, I think. Um, so I'd like to take this opportunity to, um, to pay tribute um, to um, Councillor Peter Southgate, who's been um, a really important um, councillor um, over many years and has, goodness me, what a hard job um, being chair of the Overview and Scrutiny Commission for. Um, you know, I was in short trousers when you started, um, Peter. Um, so um, thank you for the time and effort that you've put into it. And um, please, um, if you want to introduce this, uh, this report, we'd much appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Well, you know, thank you for that for some <laughs> tribute. I appreciate it. Um, and in one sense, best till last. I mean, this, this report has been quite a time in, in coming. We put the task group together in the summer of um, 2020. Um, but since then, um, other initiatives, other things have come along, in particular, the, 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 the Ormerton um, project uh, at considerable scale. And Future Merton also have been undertaking um, projects that had the capital funding for, for improvements to our high streets. And all these 
things really are, are, are moving in the same direction. They are recognizing the importance of our high streets. They are acknowledging their changed role as a result of the pandemic. In a sense, you could say that the pandemic has triggered that, that realization that our high streets already were in decline uh, and something needed to be done. But now we, I think, identify that people value them more as community hubs, would like to see them more as meeting places, um, more about socializing, less about shopping. And there are um, a number of specific recommendations in the report relating to um, the, the, the green agenda, if you like, trying to find ways of linking our, our wonderful parks, more than a good example there, you know, great park at either side, uh, into the high streets and, and greening up the high street more. Uh, recognizing the value of arts and cultural events, for example, the, the theatre quarter in Wimbledon. Um, we do see a role for, for town centre managers to uh, be the council's link to, to the businesses. Um, we also recognize that there would be value in a digital officer, an offer, sorry, and it is good to know that Future Merton are already working on this. Um, and the one other aspect of worth mentioning, the uh, importance of attracting entrepreneurs, providing space for small businesses who may well have decided they're going to work from home more in future and commute less to, to establish uh, premises. We're particularly impressed with the work of Wimbledon in this regard. And the final point I'd make is that, uh, I mean, these are recommendations you perhaps could make about any and every high street, but every high street has its unique history. And it's that um, identity through its history, really, that is, we think, the, the USP that will help to shape and provide uh, its, its identity, the thing that keeps people coming back, and in fact, feeling proud of their high street. So to take this forward, we do recognise there will need to be quite a lot of detailed work done by officers. There is, a, as recommended, the need for an action plan to be drafted by, by officers to, to bring specific, specific proposals forward for each high street. So uh, if I can thank the, the Cabinet member for a very supportive response thus far, I am very relieved to have got it into the, the life of this council chair so thank you for the opportunity to bring it to you tonight and if i can thank to the the, the scrutiny team in particular uh stella Ackington for uh, for her work on this thank you uh councillor southgate and uh this as this is your last meeting don't tell anybody else at uh, future cabinet meetings but you went over your time but i didn't want to interrupt you um however i will not necessarily be as tolerant as future um contributors at um, uh, cabinet good luck to you and thank you for the report um the lead member from our side on this is um is councillor owen pritchard owen would you like to respond on this yeah All right. Ooh. Thank you. Um, first off, I want to say thank you. I have uh, obviously been a cabinet member where, uh, with you as uh, chair, but also I've worked on a committee with you as chair, and indeed I've chaired a task group with you on, on it. Um, and over the last four years, um, I've got to know you well, and I thank you for your dedication to public service and the people and residents of Merton, and I mean that wholeheartedly. You are um, public spirited in the best sense of the word uh, or the phrase, um, so thank you very much. Um, I agree with you on, this, uh, on the uh, key issues here, which I think are the importance of our high streets um, and the way that we have for too long tolerated their decline. Um, uh, I also agree with you on what I think are really sort of um, five key points, which is um, the importance of place, right? Um, the need for us to intervene in the place the, uh, the the role of the, the place in how we as a society interact with one another, um, the need for a pleasant environment for that interaction, um, uh, and indeed the, the the sort of the role of society and how we socialise has been critical to how we operate as a community. 
And I think those things, actually, though they seem self-evidently obvious now, have not always been thus, actually. Um, the role of intervention, the role of the place, the role of society, the acceptance that we help shape that society. And I think we've come a long way in, in, in re-realizing that we do have that role. So I thank you for um, reminding us of that. And um, it is in keeping with the work that we did last year uh, with your Merton and um, an increasing re-emergence of it. I, um, I hope that the work that you've done and specifically the recommendations will help inform some of the platform of the various parties standing um, when they go forward. I, um, I know uh, my early reading of it helped inform any uh, contribution I made to our platform, so I thank you for that. And I, and I hope, um, and I'm confident that any future administration will draw from it um, because th there are recommendations, there have real substance and value, and I know that I've already chatted with James. Um, I suppose on a final point, it would it'd be, um, I don't want to be miss this, is that there is something bigger than we can do. And that's, um, it is worth mentioning though, that people are, do realise is that if we are really to tackle high streets and the high streets issue going forward, not just in Merton, but around the country, we do really need to look at the business rates issue, right? Um, uh, that's a national issue, but it is one that is core. Cool. So if there is anyone watching or anyone who has a hotline to, uh, the MP for Wimbledon, and he, he, if he has a hotline, the emergence, I'm looking at you up there, Nick, um, in the screen. Uh, we do need to adjust business rates and think forward now and think that how we do this in the future and where we're not, we have transaction rates for people who sell online to, to, to in some way sub subsidize the rebirth of high streets. I think that's something that we can all get behind. So thank you again for your work and thank you again for this report. Thank you. That's uh, that's fantastic. And um, and yes, obviously, as an administration, we we're just terribly proud um, of our high streets and, um, and local communities. And um, the importance of the high streets has really shone through um, over the last um, couple of years, when many of us have been sort of like tied down um, in their homes, or pretty much um, and very much uh, within their local communities. Um, and so, this piece of work is extremely timely. Um, and gives us a lot of um, pause for thought as we look to the future. I'd like to thank um, both of you, um, Councillor Southgate um, and Pritchard, um, for your commitment over many years um, to, um, to tackling um, this issue. Can we agree the recommendations A and B? Thank you very much, that's agreed. And then we'll move on to um, uh, item eight, which is the award of an agreement for the provision and maintenance of a community equipment service um, via an integrated procurement hub. And the lead member on this is Councillor Rebecca Lanning. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is hopefully a fairly straightforward and pragmatic report, thanks in full to Keith Burns, our Assistant Director in Community and Housing. In terms of the report content, as colleagues will be aware, we have a statutory duty to provide community equipment to support disabled and vulnerable older people in their homes, with the aim of which is to help them live independently, which is also a core ambition for this council for all of our residents. So the equipment this report refers to largely includes um, items such as commodes, perch stalls, and hoists. So one of the most important benchmarking indicators for us was going to be value for money. On assessment, our recommended provider is the London Borough of Croydon via an integrated procurement hub, which is not only the most competitively priced, they also provide a more efficient service and, as the report details, a number of other additional benefits. Um, but colleagues will also note that to guard against any risks, we're also undertaking a robust mitigation plan. So we'll be awarding the agreement on a rolling basis um, with the ability with, to withdraw by giving not less than six months notice, as well as undertaking a value for money exercise every three years. Um, the lead officer, John Morgan, is having a very well-deserved break, but I know Keith Burns, who's led on this report, is in the chamber and may wish to add to um, my points. So, um, Chair, if you don't mind, I'll hand over to Keith. Uh, yeah, thank you, Councillor Lang, um, for that um, for that excellent report. Um, Keith um, Burns is the is the lead officer in the room as the assistant director um, here on behalf of, um, of John Morgan, the, the interim director of community and housing. Um, Keith, would you like to add anything or draw anything to our attention? 
Thank you, Chair. I don't think I need to add anything to what Councillor Lanning has said. If I can just um, convey again, I know that uh, Councillor Lanning already has done our, our gratitude um, to, um, to you um, and, um, and your team for um, the thought and effort that's gone into um, this report and, um, and really to your commitment to the, uh, the service users as well really shines through um, throughout and it's uh, something that uh, we're very proud of in Merton um, that, um, that we do um, look after our clients extremely well. So thank you for that. Can we agree the recommendations A to C? Agreed. That's agreed. Thank you very much. So having done items 9 and 10 already, we will move on to the financial monitoring report, um, which is um, the lead member on this is Councillor Pritchard again. Um, so thanks. For, uh, thank you for the officers for pulling this report together. Effectively, it's a, it's the post period ten report that's projecting a six and a half uh, million out outed variance. So that's a third of a million less at the end of period nine. Um, I just want to raise. I just want to mention five things. I suppose. Uh, first off, is uh, this is only. Uh, after period 10, so we have two more months yet in which to see this. This doesn't include any settlement on in your DSG funding. So we're, that's cool. we expect that uh, if it is forthcoming it, within the next month or so to alter what in your accounts look like. It needs to be seen in the context of an £8 million underspend last year. We said at the time that uh, many of the costs that came with the public health crisis um, would have delayed impacts. Um, and that has been born, uh, proved to be true. Um, and then last, uh, fourthly, last year we used that eight million to replenish reserves, both the general reserves, but also the, uh, uh, the balance in the budget reserve. That has been proven to be the correct decision. Again, I do know that some people were telling us to spend that uh, at the time, but it has been because what we're doing is balancing into year and we can use those reserves for any uh, overspend this year. And finally, I just want to make this point because I did hear one or two people remark on it um, last month is that um, on the accuracy of financial forecasting um, for what is a 570 million pound a year organization or there or thereabouts. Um, much of what we do is demand led. Um, much of what we do very hugely dependent on circumstances that are beyond our control. Um, what we're getting when we're getting it within these margins of about 5 million or 1% margins that should be applauded. And the way that we manage that year on year by using in-year spend, uh, in-year over underspend to replenish supplies, to use uh, balance in the budget reserves is a good way of doing things. So I thank the financial team once again for taking this approach and ensuring that we have stability year on year in the way that they approach the finances. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Councillor Pritchard. And um, having having done the um, um, having fulfilled the role of cabinet member for finance for um, for almost as long as, as Councillor Southgate was uh, has been the, uh, the the chair of overview and scrutiny, um, can I um, you know say my in, immense gratitude to um, to you and to the uh, the team that um, that every year produces these financial monitoring reports, which are extremely helpful. Um, pieces of work to the good running of the um, the council. Um, Councillor, uh, sorry, uh, Caroline Holland, who's the director of uh, corporate services, is not here tonight. I believe that um, that Ellis Kelly is that correct? You're um, uh, you're here to um, to add anything and um, to, to to show us up um, for uh, for not knowing anywhere near as much as you and your team do. Do you have anything you'd like to um, to add to Councillor Pritchard's opening remarks? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, no, nothing to add to the summary. Um, just on the point of uh, accuracy of reporting, just a reminder that when we do our outturn report in a few months' time, that will have our normal sort of analysis on accuracy throughout the year and how we can improve going forward. So we'll always be reviewing that. Oh, that's brilliant. Um, we, we do appreciate um, very much um, the, the work that you do. And, um, and thank you, Alice. And if you can pass that on to your colleagues, um, that would be much appreciated as well. Thank you. In, in the meeting, can we agree recommendations A and B? They are agreed. Excellent. 
Okay, so then we'll move on to um, item 12, which is a verbal update, um, and um, it's on selective licensing and empty homes. And the lead member on this is Councillor Martin Wilson. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to give obviously a brief update to Cabinet in terms of um, ongoing work, which is happening in terms of a potential selective licensing um, scheme, which would require a license for private rented housing and houses in multiple occupation and work into an Article 4 direction that would require use small homes and flat shares to seek planning permission um, if they are HMOs of six people um, or more. Um, as Cabinet colleagues are aware, uh, the number of HMO conversions has been a considerable concern to many members um, in this Council over the past um, few years. We've obviously seen the number growing, growing quite considerably. Um, some of the, these have been allowed under permitted um, development, so there is no recourse um, to the planning system um, in terms of allowing these homes um, to be converted. Uh, this is of concern to many local residents um, in the borough. Um, so obviously as cabinet member, I have asked for um, further work um, to be um, undertaken um, to see whether we would can bring in an Article 4 um, within um, Merton and to undertake uh, research um, into this um, area. Um, similarly, in terms of um, hazards of multiple occupation, um, we have seen councils introduce selective landlord licensing schemes um, across um, the country, um, which is obviously to improve the conditions of um, private um, sector um, tenants, um, but also as well to improve um, the quality um, of um, those homes. To introduce any kind of HMO and selective licensing, it will require um, building up um, an evidential um, base. Um, there has been recent cases in London Borough of Croydon where the evidential base um, was not strong enough and its selective landlord licensing scheme and Article 4 um, for continuation uh, did not get um, approved. Um, in an ideal world, um, this would be um, automatic and these powers um, would be um, statutory. Um, for HMOs at the moment, it's either five or more people within a household or um, three tenants of more than one household or houses of three or more um, stories. Um, I personally think we could go the whole way in terms of um, government, um, but we only can do use the powers that we have actually um, available to us in terms of looking at the introduction um, of um, selective um, licensing. So in terms of um, both selective licensing and um, Article um, 4, um, we are developing um, licensing viability modelling, including um, cost modelling. Um, we expect that work um, to be completed um, in um, the summer. And following um, this um, review of the cost modelling and viability assessments, um, for Cabinet then to consider a report um, on um, this matter. Um, similarly, um, in terms of um, Article 4, um, a number of stages of work are needed to consider the feasibility of introducing an Article 4 um, direction. Um, we hope that a further report then is presented to um, Cabinet um, in July, but it obviously it will require um, background work um, to be um, undertaken. Uh, and the other thing in relation to um, any scheme for selective landlord licensing is to use um, the data we have available um, in terms of actually building um, uh, the case. Uh, this work will be crucial and this work um, will be um, undertaken. Um, so I would like to take this opportunity of thanking um, officers both in um, community and housing and environment and regeneration um, for the work which has been um, undertaken um, to date. Um, it clearly will be quite um, a substantial amount of work um, going forward, um, but it is my view as Cabinet member that this work um, is um, crucial and for um, decisions to be then taken about whether we introduce selective landlord licensing scheme um, or Article 4, but it has to be on a strong basis. Thank you, Leader. 
Thank you, Councillor Welton. The lead officer um, on this is, um, is Chris Lee, the Director of Environment and Regeneration. Is there anything that you'd like to add to this, Chris? Nothing to add, Chair. Officers are, are working at pace to ensure that we bring this forward as early as possible. Fantastic. Um, I had a question or have a question in the room from Councillor Brenda Fraser. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, this is a bugbear of mine, HMOs because in fact in long thornton has the second largest amount of hmos and um the residents are very unhappy about the whole situation because it covers everything it affects all the um fly tipping it affects everything that we could possibly think of and what i'd like to know is why has it taken so long for the process just mentioned to be implemented, because we really need an answer soon. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Fraser, um, for um, your question. Um, it's important that we do have the evidence um, to build in terms of the case. Um, I think it's extremely regrettable that um, the permitted development rules um, were considerably relaxed um, about 10 years ago when Eric Pickles um, was Secretary of State. Um, I believe that this actually was um, a retrograde um, step, um, but ultimately we do need to have that evidence base built um, because the Secretary of State um, can veto um, any Article 4 um, direction. So it needs to be um, on a firm footing. Um, I do share her concerns as well. You have many residents um, in certainly in my ward which is joining Long Thornton um, who have concerns about HMOs and the ability for them to actually go through on the nod without any recourse um, to um, the planning committee. Um, it doesn't necessarily say that those HMOs won't happen um, but at least there'll be that element of um, democratic control you know if an article 4 was in place where uh, the planning committee um, could determine uh, the application for HMO rather than the case at the moment where it just goes through um, automatically and there's nothing we can do um, provided it's permitted development. Thank you for that, um, Councillor Walton. Um, very clearly, um, improving conditions in the private rented um, sector is a, a, a you know, big social um, priority um, for um, all of us in the uh, in the administration, as um, Councillor Fraser's um, highlighted, and um, and you have as well, um, and it um, was something that um, emerged through your Merton as a priority of um, of residents, and that's why it is a priority now for the council in our new set of priorities, Merton 2030. Um, obviously, I would say this, but I wish it was more, a bit more of a government priority as well. That the government were as committed to um, improving um, conditions in the private rented sector. Um, as we are, it's an issue that does affect um, the whole country, doesn't just affect us, um, but, um, but where it does affect us, we'll um, aim to, um, to work on it. And it's clear that we are doing um, our best to, um, to help residents um, in those, um, those conditions, despite um, not necessarily being able to rely on the government to, um, to help us with that, um, to take action. Um, so I'd like to thank um, Councillor Welton and um, officers. Um, clearly, we um, agreed. Uh, motions on this back in November. And I think it's um, really helpful that we've had this update um, now to demonstrate that real progress um, towards moving towards um, what uh, our ultimate ambition um, is, is being achieved and, um, and long may your work on this continue. So thank you very much. Can we um, note the verbal report? I think that's all we're being asked of um, tonight. Thank you very much. Um, and unfortunately, um, we need to um, to move into um, private session. I'll just see if I can find the um, the correct wording. Um, but can we resolve that the public are excluded from the meeting during consideration of the following reports um, on the grounds that they are exempt from disclosure for the reason for the reasons stated in the reports? Can that be agreed. <laughs>